Well, hello. Uh, so yes, I am live here in my studio. I'll, um, here you go. Nice little wide shot. There you go. You can see me here. I am sat here in my studio and I am going to be uh, doing a quick little live stream video this evening. Um, I thought I'd just take a minute before I start just to explain why I've chosen to do a live stream um, because Basically, I haven't been on, on YouTube in absolutely ages. It's been months and months and months since I last made a video and I've had people asking me, where have you gone? Why are you not on your, your channel anymore? Um, and the, the truth is that I've just had so many other projects going on recently, which has been great. I've had some amazing projects and I've managed to work with some, some really good people recently. Um, and I will try and share some of that. There's some of that um, getting to a point now where it can all go public. So we're gonna start sharing some of that stuff soon, which will be great. Um, but the upshot has meant that I haven't had the time to be on this channel doing things on this channel. So I thought rather than um, filming something and editing it, because it takes quite a while for that to happen, uh, I thought what I'll do is I will just go live and I'll do a live stream and then at least I've got something out there and hopefully uh, I can get some stuff out quicker if I do it live. So I might have a little bit of a season where I'm doing a few live streams. Um, there might be a few of these coming up. So please um, it, jump in the comments and let me know what you think. If this is working, if you like this, um, I've got a few little cameras set up here. So I've got my desk shot so you can see what's going on in the desk. As you can see, there's not a lot here today. I've just got an iPad with some notes and then a stream deck, um, which I'm gonna be using to control everything with. So if this works, if you like this, if this is helpful for you, uh, then give it a thumbs up. And um, as I say, just jump in the comments and just let me know what you like. Um, if there's anything I can do to improve it, that would be great. But today, the video I wanted to make was my five top tips on how to improve your audio mix for your church um, sound on a Sunday morning. So I'm gonna take you through the five things that I do when I'm building a mix, how I would do it, what I would do in order to, um, to start shaping that and what that would look like. Uh, and just give you these five, five stepping stones, these five kind of pointers that hopefully if you can follow these uh, will help you to improve your mix as well. So let's jump into it and take a look at these five top tips. So number one, my first top tip when it comes to building a mix is always make sure the vocal, in particular the lead vocal, is front and center, the loudest thing in the mix. Um, one, one great tip here is to close your eyes and listen to what you can hear. So often um, people fall into a trap of mixing with their eyes and what that means is if you look at the console when you're looking at the desk, if you've got one fader that's higher than all the others, you would think because that's the, la the highest fader that therefore that is the loudest thing. And so, so often people fall into this trap of thinking, well, I've pushed that fader up, so therefore it must be the loudest thing that I can hear. But that's not necessarily always true. If you haven't got your gain structures right, if you haven't done um, some of the other prep work that you might have needed to do, first of all, to get to that point, you could push that fader up as long as you like. If it has no gain, it isn't gonna give you anything in the mix. So don't fall into the trap of mixing with your eyes. Make sure you're mixing with your ears. And the best way to do that is to close your eyes. If you close your eyes and stand in the room and think, what can I actually hear right now? Um, you will be able to be far better able to make that mix and to make those decisions and to make the adjustments that you need to make. So if you shut your eyes and you listen to your mix and you know that my lead vocal fader is at the top, um, I, I physically can't push it any further, shut your eyes and actually listen to what you can hear and but I still can't hear the lead vocal, then there's probably something that's gone wrong somewhere further downstream. So you might need to go back and look at game structures or something else. But close your eyes, listen to your mix, and make sure that vocal is front and center, the loudest thing. There is nothing else that uh, is, is taking away from that. That needs to be the most prominent thing in your mix. So that's number one. Number two is going to be then, think about what instruments you need to drive that particular song. And these next two points are gonna be a little bit gray and a little bit difficult because depending on your context, depending on what you have, depending on what's going on in your building, um, you will have a number of different things that could go into these two slots, numbers two and three. You will come on to three in a minute. But number two, thinking about, thinking about that lead instrument, what's gonna be sort of driving this song. Um, for me, I would always try and make that 
drums, generally speaking. So again, depending on the building, depending on the context, depending on what's going on, I would like to have drums quite prominent behind that mix, but it does depend a little bit as to what's going on and uh, what that song needs. If the song is a softer, more gentle song, um, then maybe not, but there's just so many variety, so many options here, so many different ways that you could go about doing this that it's very difficult to give a hard and fast, oh yes, it's always going to be the drums, uh, or yes, it's going to be the guitar, because you need to just think about the song, think about what it needs, what's going to help this, and what's going to help just kind of carry it and lead it forwards. So it could be drums, it could be like a rhythm guitar, if you've got something that needs a bit of a rhythm to it that's going to help to sort of drive that, particularly if it's a more hard, um, fast-paced song, kind of quite a high tempo. The rhythm guitar, the strumming of the rhythm guitar might help that. If it's something much softer and much more melodic, um, you might not even have those instruments playing in that song. If it's a very soft, gentle, laid-back song, you might say, actually, we're going to leave the drums out of this one completely, um, and maybe it's the keyboard that takes this one, and maybe in, in the softer songs you need something a bit more melodic, a bit more gentle, a bit softer, and maybe something like a keyboard might carry that better. So it, it's going to vary a lot. There's going to be a lot of variation in this, and it's going to vary from building to building, from band to band, from song to song. There's just going to be a lot of variation. But think, what does this song need? What's going to help it? What's going to carry it? What's going to drive it forwards? What's going to be the thing that we need to support um, to support that lead vocal? So we've got lead vocal front and centre, and then what's going to sit underneath that? What's just going to help carry that is your second point. So think about your instruments. Think about what you need to put underneath. Okay, point number three is going to be then we can start thinking about everything else. Now, Again, as I say, this is a bit of a grey one. This is there's there's lots of possible things that could fall into this. Everything else kind of obviously covers a lot of things, um, but I can't really define it any more than that because it's going to depend on what you have. So, for example, I can't say to you, "Hey, always pan guitar, electric guitar one to the left and electric guitar two to the right," because you might not have two electric guitars. So it doesn't work that way. Um, these are principles that hopefully you can take and apply in whatever context you have. But one of the things that you're going to want to think about here is going to be that stereo image. Think about what have we got in the physical space, in the building that we're in, um, and how can we move those sounds to the left and to the right and have them kind of create some stereo width in our mix. So it might be that you take two electric guitars and pan one left and one right to create that, that mix. It might be that you use some of your backing vocals, and I will do this quite often. I will take some backing vocals and I'll put one in the left and one into the right. And that does a few things. That creates that stereo width for me. Um, but it also creates space in the middle for the lead vocal to come forwards more. And as I was saying in point one, we want to make sure that lead vocal is front and centre. Sometimes if you've got um, more than one vocal, particularly if there's more than one vocalist who's singing a melody part, um, if you've got a backing singer who's also singing a melody part, sometimes they can really they can really clash with each other and they can really um, almost take away from each other. And we need to find a way to create that space and that separation for them. And stereo uh, imaging is is a great way to do that. So I can push one vocalist off to the left and one to the right and, and create some stereo space, which actually leaves a gap in the middle for our lead vocal to go into. So things like that can be really helpful. And then think about all the other things that you can see on the stage. So you may well by now have already positioned some drums, you may well by now have already positioned a guitar, you may well, may well by now have already positioned a keyboard in your mix. Um, but just have a look around the stage. This is a point where it could be helpful to use your eyes and actually look across the stage and say, what can I see on the stage and can I hear those things in my mix? Um, and so you can look and you could say, well, I've got a, a flutist on the stage or whatever. I've got a, a violin on the stage or I've got uh, a percussionist on the stage. And can I see those things on the stage and then can I hear them in the mix? Think about all the other stuff that you've got that you need to try and find somewhere to fit them into that mix. And you might need to start, um, depending on how much stuff you've got to try and fit into that mix, you might need to think about stereo imaging, but you might also need to think about your frequencies that you've got available. Is that thing going to fit nicely into the low frequencies or the higher frequencies or somewhere in the middle? 
Um, if it's somewhere in the middle, be very careful because lots of things can end up drifting into the middle. That mid frequency band can often be somewhere where a lot of things occupy that space. Your vocals can sit in there, your keyboard can sit in there, your guitar can sit in there. Even things like snare drum and possibly some of the toms can all end up sitting in that mid frequency spot. Uh, and so if you've got a lot of things happening in that frequency spot, you might need to start saying, well, let's maybe see if we can warm up our acoustic guitar, take out some of the high frequencies and, and push it slightly lower down the frequency range. Or maybe you do the opposite. Maybe we take some of the low frequencies out of our guitar uh, and brighten that sound up and see if we can move the guitar up our frequency range a little bit. And those sorts of tricks can just help to create that space. So think about everything else that you need to try and fit into this mix. Where is it gonna go and how can, how can I make it fit in there? So think about the frequencies, think about stereo imaging, think about how can we create some space to fit these other things in. Okay, so we had number one, our vocal, front and center, right in the front of our mix. Number two, what instruments are gonna really help to support and carry that, and how can we sort of drive that forwards musically? And then number three, we can start positioning all the other stuff. Where can all those other things start to fit in around those, those things? Now, just because I've said that the main thing in your mix needs to be the vocal, doesn't necessarily mean it needs to be the first thing that you put in your sound check. Um, you could sound check all the other things first if you want to do that. There's lots of different ways that people like to do sound check. You might sound check drums, drums first, for instance. That's fine. Do that. But when you get to the end, once you've started to build your mix and once you've got to a point where you're happy with your mix and you're happy with your sound, you need to then make sure that that is the point where my vocal is front and center. Um, so it doesn't really matter what order you put these things in, as long as by the time you get to the end, this is the order that they are in at the end. So first of all, your main vocal. Secondly, your instrument that's gonna drive that. Thirdly, everything else, your other vocalists, all the other instruments, everything else that's happening on the stage. Now my fourth point is to think about the low end. Think about the bass. The bass makes such a difference to a mix. So often in churches I find that people don't think about the low end. They don't think about what's going on in the low frequencies. Um, and this can cause a number of problems. So first of all, if you don't have enough low end um, in your mix, what you can often end up doing is making the mix sound, um, it, it becomes high frequency heavy. And when it becomes high frequency heavy, what tends to happen is it sounds more shrill and more harsh and a lot more in your face. The mix will actually often sound louder not because it is louder, just because it's more uncomfortable for people because it's, it's high frequency heavy. And I, one of the things I often find in churches is people shy away from low end and the subs and the bass frequencies because they think, oh, we, we don't want too much bass, we'll upset people by putting bass into it. But actually often the reverse can happen and if you reduce your low frequencies in your mix, what you can find is your mix becomes very harsh, very high frequency, very um, nasally, very unpleasant. And that can give the effect of sounding louder than it really is. You can actually make something sound louder by adding low, uh, sorry, sound quieter by adding low frequencies into it or sound louder by taking the low frequencies away. Um, but the, those high frequencies can be quite piercing and quite sharp and quite hard on your ears. And so if you balance that out with some low frequencies, push the low frequencies a little bit more, you can actually give a, a lot more warmth to that sound. Um, and you can really kind of give that sound a bit more grounding. And, and as I say, it just feels less harsh. It feels less in your face. It feels less loud overall. Um, even if the actual decibel level has increased because we're now pushing more frequencies into our mix, uh, it just feels more comfortable for people. So make sure you really consider the low end. Think about what's going on in the low end. What have we got down there that we can push into that? And really try to give some warmth to your mix to create a nice balance across that mix. And again, it's one that's very difficult. Um, typically, I would say your kick drum and your bass guitar are gonna sit down there quite nicely. Uh, but if you don't have a kick drum and if you don't have a bass guitar, then you're gonna to have to think about what can we use to warm our mix up. Um, it might be the keyboard, low frequencies on the keyboard. You could boost the low end a little bit on your keyboard to give some warmth to the low end of that mix. 
uh, if you've got a percussion set up or you're using a cajon or something like that, try to get as much low end out of that as you possibly can. You might have to get a bit creative. You might have to think outside the box a little bit, think about what else can you use, um, what can, can fill that space. But it's really important that you get some good low end in your mix to help bring some balance across the whole thing and to make the whole thing just sound warmer and more pleasing for people who are listening to it. So think about your lead vocal, think about your, your kind of main instrument, what's going to be kind of driving the song. Think about everything else on the stage. Can I see and can I hear everything else on the stage? Think about your low end. Make sure we've got some low frequencies in there. Make sure that our mix is nice and warm and rounded and not just shrill and harsh and high frequency heavy. Um, so make sure it's well balanced. And then finally, once you've done all of those things, you then get to the point where you can start having some fun and playing with some effects, reverbs, delays, choruses, whatever else you want to have a, have a play with. Um, but again, so often I find in churches that people, they get their vocals up and then the, the next thing they're doing is they're diving for the reverbs and starting to put some reverb on there. And there's definitely a place for reverbs. I love reverbs. I use probably far more reverbs than I really should, um, but they are they are great. They're a really good tool to have, but just make sure you've got all your other things in place before you start messing with your effects. Don't worry about the effects until you've got the basic fundamentals all in place. So get all that other stuff together, get all those things in place, and only once you've done those other four things can you then start to add your effects and your reverbs and delays and whatever else into your mix. If you haven't got those other things in place, don't worry about the effects, leave those off. If you don't have time to get to the effects because you've spent so long sorting all those other things, don't worry about it. Your mix is gonna sound loads better just by doing those other four other things. So get those first four in place before you worry about the effects and only deal with those effects once you're happy with the first four that I've just shared with you. So that is my five top tips on how to build a better sound mix in your church. I hope that's been helpful for you. Um, if it has, I would love it if you would go and subscribe and hit the bell icon and give it a thumbs up. All of those things are really helpful. Um, and it would be great if, as I say, if you've got any thoughts or if you want to see more of these live streams, then please chuck that into the comments. And that's it. I will see you in my next video. Thanks for watching. I'll see you soon.